Recording in progress. All right, let's start with a word of prayer and then we'll go right into our study using 1 John 1 9. And Father, we know how important it is to be in fellowship with you. And so before we begin, 1 John 1 9 is the protocol, which simply says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we'll just take a moment of silence and name any sins to you if we have any, and then we'll proceed with our study. Father, you are gracious, and the reason why we're here is because we love thee. And Father, we know that you first loved us with an unconditional love, which has been demonstrated through your Son, Jesus Christ. It's solely because of his grace and his love towards us that we can even assemble together as your children. Father, what a privilege it is, and we're at awe in the fact that we are children of God. And so by adoption, and so Father, we take this seriously to know uh, when we study your word that it brings you honor and glory because you alone deserve it. Your son Jesus Christ said we should worship you in spirit and in truth, which is why we begin with 1 John 1, 9, so that we can recover the filling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. For we know that we could do nothing apart from his enablement. So we thank you, Father, for this opportunity to commit this hour to you, because it's only through you that we can navigate through the challenges of life and thus find the answers in Bible doctrine as we study them together. Help us now to focus on the information that we're going to look at tonight, we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So the passage that we're going to look at or the verses that we're going to look at tonight is taken from Ephesians chapter 5, 1 and 2. So we're just going to look at these verses here and see if anything pops out. And so I'll read it for the recording and then just kind of follow it up, follow along in your, with your eyes and with your ears and see if anything stands out for you. It says to uh, therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Now, I saw, I'm sorry for the little star on the bottom right. It's not any kind of a uh, occultic sign or anything. I, you'll sometimes see that I leave marks on the corner or on the side of the verses or even on my slides, uh, the book that we're covering. And so that helps me. I, if you could just imagine on my iPad, I have several hundred slides that I've uh, snapped on my iPad. And so sometimes when I have to scroll through and add these pictures onto the Zoom, like what we're doing now. I sometimes, that's why you'll, you've seen in the past, I'll have um, pages jumbled or the verses jumbled. They don't match because I have, like I said, I have several hundred slides that are kind of following back to back. And sometimes when I select them to share, I pick the wrong ones. And so I found recently that if I just make a note or make some kind of notation or some mark on the particular verse or the page, it helps me kind of keep it streamlined to the subject that we're looking at. So that's not a uh, occultic sign or anything on the bottom right there. That just lets me know that this is the first slide to share. So again, going back to the passage or the verse, therefore be imitators of God as dear children. And then walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So I want you to look at the verse and tell me if there's anything here that stands out to you. And then let's just kind of make some observations and see what you see. Share what you see, and then we'll kind of go through it and then move right into our study. So this is the verse for observation. Again, we're training our eyes to see what's there. Uh, for example, I would hit it with, what's an imitator? If I were to um, tackle this on my own, I would first thing I would say is, 
what's an imitator? And he wants, Paul wants us to be an imitator of who? God. So I would say, hmm, that's interesting. We're to, we're to mimic and imitate God? Why? As dear children. So I would, I would take some time here and say, okay, so Paul wants me, or at least the recipients of this letter in, in Ephesians, to be imitating God as dear children. So I would look at that conjunction as and say, okay, here's something that's very important. It says, imitate God as. As what? As dear children. And then verse 2 continues, but it has a slightly different uh, focus. The focus now is in walking. In a, it's a particular walk. It's walking in the sphere of love. And then he continues and says, well, as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So it's very, very interesting. And to know that because of the principle of, of continuity, this not only applies to those who uh, Paul was writing to, but it applies to us as well. So these are instructions that pertain to us as believers in Christ as well. So what else do you guys see here? I gave you my two cents, so... You guys see anything in this, uh, these two verses here? Just unmute your mic and tell me what you see. There's no wrong answer. I'll say if it's wrong, I'll just say, ah, oh, well, that's one way of looking at it, but I'm, there's technically no wrong answer when we're studying together. This is an idea. The objective here is to get comfortable with sharing amongst ourselves here because the truth is we don't really get to voice out what we think the verse is saying much because one we probably don't get to get into the word of God enough and two how often do you get to engage in a conversation with someone uh, other than yourself or your loved one or a family or a friend right and so this these kind of studies are designed to give us an opportunity to communicate communicate what you see so that if someone were to ask you about this verse or these two verses here, what would you say on the fly? Bolstering your confidence so that when you're out there as an ambassador, as a representative, as a disciple of Christ, you can at least have some confidence in knowing you can do this. So, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to use these opportunities to not just see what's there, not just to train you to see the text for itself, but I'm, I'm encouraging you to communicate things so that at, when you're out there in the real world, you would know that you can do this. Because when you do this regularly, your confidence goes up. Because when I was uh, first starting in the ministry, or even before the ministry, just in Bible studies, I was very timid. I could not share, I could not read a verse. I was very nervous. I said, oh, I don't want to say anything because they might laugh at me. But the truth is, as I sat in these studies, the more that I sat in these studies, my confidence started to rise. So that when someone would say something, I would be more inclined to say something too because I realized I could have said the same thing. That was exact, this is exactly what I would have said. And then I found out that, you know, I was really, on the same page with everybody and so my confidence would go up and guess what I found myself sharing with my friends but if I didn't attend these studies I wouldn't have any confidence in myself because I don't know what I would say unless given the opportunity so that's why these studies like this are very particular so not only am I taking taking you through verses so that you can train your eyes to see what's there but when I say unmute your mic, it's not to embarrass you. And again, it's strictly voluntary. But I'm encouraging you to see that it's not so bad that you can actually say something. Your English is perfectly fine, even though English might be a second language for some of you. If you're doing this for the cause of Christ and you do this because you love him, you're going to be able to do it. But the only way your confidence will go up is if you from time to time would share something based on what you see. 
And I'm not going to say, ah, oh, why did you say that? That's silly, Rudy. Winston, why did you even say that? That's, that's baloney. No. I'm here to encourage you all to see what you're capable of doing as a group. All of us who are trying to learn together. So that when you're out there tomorrow, next week, the following day, you'll be able to talk to someone. Yeah, I'll give you another good example. I went to visit Pastor Dan in his place. And there was a Filipina there. And um, so I'm sit seated across from Pastor Dan. And this lady works behind the, um, the kitchen. She's, she's offering food. Uh, she provides food. She, whatever you do, you tell her what you want on the, um, on the counter, and then you give the room number, and they, they charge your room, that kind of thing. And so I realized that this lady was Filipina. So I, I've seen her in the past, because every time I visit Dan, we go to the uh, cafeteria, and we sit down and chat. And so this time it was interesting, because as I was talking to Dan, I looked at her, and she looked at me, and all of a sudden I got this nudge to kind of talk to her. And I'm like, right now, Lord? And I, I'm talking to Dan. I'm talking to Pastor Dan. And, and it was pretty pronounced. So I said, okay, 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 I, I hear you. So I wasn't sure how I was going to segue into someone who was behind the counter. And so I went up to her and I just said, are you Filipino? She said, yeah. I said, oh, great, where do you live? And she told me where she lived. And I said, well, I'm originally from California, so on and so forth. And then, would you believe that she said, you know, my, my family's originally from, I don't remember the town. It was a small town. She said it was very small. You know, my, my parents passed away. Uh, my mom, you know, she's just, uh, you know, recently I was depressed. And um, she used the word depressed. I was surprised, and I'm listening to her. She said, well, I, I'm depressed, but, you know, I, I think of my mom, and I feel good. I, I, my, I feel better. It's like she understands me, and I feel, I feel better, and I go back to work. And I said, and I said you know, um, I saw her name, Margie. I said, Margie, you know, um, I'm a pastor in the area. I said, on Friday, I come here to see Pastor Dan on Tuesday and Friday, I'll come back. I'll give you my card. I want to invite you to church. And I said, I'm going to introduce you. We have a, a couple who's a Filipina. And my wife is Filipina. And I'll introduce you to some people. And we're just a small group. And I want to be able to get to know you and share some things with you that I think will make a difference. I, I want you to know God loves you. And she said, oh, what's the address to your church? I said, well... I'm coming back Friday. <laughs> I didn't ha I didn't memorize the address to the church, so I said I'll bring it Friday because I don't know it off the top of my head. I didn't have the card with me, so she said okay. So I said ah, should have had my card with me. But I share this because you might not, you you will never know if God is going to either do something and direct you and show you that there's an opportunity. And you don't want to close your ears on that. Because I actually literally said, now, my, my God is my witness. I said, Lord, I, I see her all the time. I don't really think she wants to talk to me. I just, I'm here for Dan. And it was very pronounced. It was so clear. He, it was just a sense that I need to talk to her some more. It was strong enough for me to say, if I don't, I'm going to regret this. I don't know why I am sensing I need to talk to her. I turn and look at her. I approach the counter to where she was. And I, my only words were, because I, I, the context of where we were and the timing of it all was, okay, um, I couldn't say, well, the Lord wanted me to talk to you. So I, I just, on the fly, I needed to come up with something that would allow me to talk to her because it was just kind of one of those abrupt moments where I said, why, why now, Lord? But I listen, and I want you to listen too. So I went to her, <clears throat> and I said, her name was Margie. Margie, um, <clears throat> are you Filipina? 
So I used the nationality. I, I saw what, I was looking at her and I said, maybe I can use that as a segue. Are you Filipina? And she said, yes. I said, oh, I'm Filipino too. And of course, you know my friend Dan. He said, oh yeah, I know Dan. He's here every day. <clears throat> I said, yeah. And she said, uh, I said, where are you from? Uh, I, I, in the area. And she said, oh, I'm from here. And then she said, I'm originally from the Philippines. Do you speak Tagalog? I said, no, I don't. I'm born here in, in, in the U.S., in the States. And she said, oh, my parents from from here. And my parents are passed away. But, you know, then she just abruptly, just like that, she said, but, you know, I've been depressed. And I said, well, really? She said, yeah, just recently I've been depressed. And, you know, I just think of my mom. And I said, Okay, I'm going to capitalize on that. Oh, you've been depressed? I said, I'd like to invite you to church and I want you to know all about God. And she said, yeah, give me the address. And there I was. I dropped the ball on that one. I didn't have the address with me. But it just flowed. Nothing, everything just happened quickly. Oh, give me the address. I said, even before that, I said, I'd like to invite you to church. I want you to know God loves you. And I will introduce you to some people. And she said, yeah, give me your address. And I said, oh, my gosh, that was my fault. I blundered there. But she was still positive. She was still interested. And so before I left, I said, you have my word. Friday, I will be here to see you. I'll give you the address. And I'd like you to come to church. She said, yeah, I'm in the area. You're near Springfield? Yeah. I said, okay, you're on. And I'll introduce you to some people and I want to teach you what God says. He loves you, Margie. Oh, I, I, that's good. And I share this with you because that's verse 1 and 2. Right there and then. Be imitators of God as dear children. I was acting as a child. Walking in love as Christ also loved us. And given himself for us. And that us expands not only to just the believers... But we know with other books of the Bible, for God so loved the world. So, <clears throat> I, I, I took this, but these, these weren't the verses, but I took what I knew and I said, I need to listen to God. And I share this with you so that you can see that it's through ongoing communications back and forth like this that will help us have our confidence in communicating to other people. Now, I must say that I've been doing this for a while, which is true, but I want you to have the confidence as well so that if you were to come across someone and you sense God is nudging you or saying, here's an opportunity, talk to him, talk to her, you'll be in a position to do so. But that won't come naturally or normally, especially if you're not taking the time to engage like what we're doing now. So I'm not saying you can't, but the, the most likely it'll come easier if you're open to engaging with a nucleus of family right here. So if you can talk to me and others on the study comfortably, then your confidence is going to go up so that when you come across someone who needs to talk to you or you need to talk to, it's going to become easier. So that's why we do these kind of studies. So now I'll, I'm going to stop gabbing away. And does anybody see here anything in verses 1 and 2? Anything pop out? I have a question. Yes. So in the, in the first verse you have God, mm -hmm. and then in the second verse you have Christ, and then it refers back to God. Mm -hmm. So why does it do that? Very good. Very good observation there. So God then Christ, then back to God, right? So you can see part of the Trinity involved here. The idea is when you look at portions of God's word, you'll usually, if you're, if you're paying attention to the text, you'll sometimes see that you'll see the triune Godhead or at least the Father and Christ working to, uh, together, cooperating together. So here, the imitators of God in verse 1, and then verse 2, Christ is the one here who gave himself for us. So we're to imitate God as children, and we're to walk in love, verse 2, 
as Christ also loved us and gave himself. So there in verse 2, it, it has more of the sacrificial component. In verse 1, it's more of be imitators of the Father, meaning love of the Father, because we're his children. You know, when Joshua was younger, he would always, he won't admit it now, but um, he would always look up to us as parents. I think as parents, we... Sometimes our kids would look up to us and sometimes they would even imitate us, right? And that's because they love us and they, they think the world of us. Daddy, daddy is Superman, that kind of thing. Or mommy is Superwoman. And so they tend to gravitate towards us because we love them. Love has some, sometimes love has a way of wanting, uh, the younger ones to imitate the ones that they love. And so likewise, when we sense the love of the Father, I think it encourages us to be imitators of God or the Father. And I think that's what we're seeing in verse 1. And so 1 is talking about focusing on imitating God. Verse 2, we're to walk in love because, and the focus now is on Christ because He's the only one out of the triune Godhead that we, we can see and we can identify with because he had the second nature of humanity. And we can ultimately see his sacrifice which was displayed on the cross. And so when you see verse 2, there's this component of sacrifice to God. And that's what we can, uh, do, uh, that's what we can follow as far as Jesus Christ. We imitate the Father, but we walk in a specific way as displayed by Christ which is in love. The Father, we we get we gain more about him. We see more about we see him more when we take in the totality of scripture, Old and New Testament. But it's very easy, much easier to zoom in on the life of Christ because of the gospel accounts and the epistles. So I think there's a a converging of the two, Jasmine, of uh, following God and walking in a particular way. Because in, as far as walking, we see more of that in the person of Christ. We see what he did. If there's 99 that are safe and one goes astray, you go after the, the one. So you see uh, Paul Harn kind of bringing the two together. Be like the Father, but walk the way Christ walked. So hopefully that, that makes a little sense. But um, that's what I see Very here. Good. Yeah. Very good explanation. Yeah, that's what I see there. Thank you, Jasmine. Anybody else see anything here? Verse one and two. It's the same, it's the same thing, but you you said it most. <laughs> you said what I was going to say, but uh, in verse one it talks about God. He, he's the authority there. He's right. Authority, just like uh, a uh, child's parents is the yeah. authority. Yeah. Here he's talking about also that we should be. Functioning in a childlike manner. Right. Just uh, God gives us instructions here. Our mm -hmm. parents give us instructions, and mm -hmm. so the child is to be obedient and and uh, and respect and honor their parents' authority. Right. Very good. <laughs> Second thing I want. <coughs> my voice here. Mm -hmm. Second thing I wanted to say is that um, to I get to. Uh, Identify, know the meaning, what sweet smell and aroma is. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that in whatever conversation we have with people mm -hmm. or at events, we should always leave the fragrance of Jesus behind. Yeah. I, in our conversations. In our conversation. And the idea here is as we're walking in love, as Christ also loved us, and we're walking in a sacrificial manner, it becomes like a sm sweet smelling aroma to God. You notice that a, a, an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. So as we're walking in love, the sweet smelling aroma goes before the Father. And we kind of see a, a hint of that in Revelation. Remember the prayers of the martyrs, the prayer of the saints. They would rise up as a sweet smelling aroma to God, the throne of God. So I think when we're walking in love, as we're walking as Christ loved, and <clears throat> that becomes like a sweet-smelling aroma 
not only amidst the people, but more importantly before God. So our lifestyle is a, in a sacrificial manner is a, a sweet smelling aroma, not only to the people around us as we're extending grace to those around us because we're walking in love, but it also goes before the throne room of grace and it becomes a sweet smelling aroma to God. So we're compliant to God as, as mandated here. We're impacting others. We call this blessing by association. So as we're walking in love, we're blessing them by association. Why? Because Gladys is not mean. Gladys is not taking advantage of someone. So as you're impacting them by walking in love as Christ did, they're, they're blessed by association because maybe they had a bad day and they put down this person and said, you know what, I hope you don't get the job. I hope you get sick. I hope you don't recover from that illness. And so here comes Gladys walking in love, imitating God. You become a sweet smelling aroma to this person and to God. So your lifestyle is going to impact people only, and it's a big only, if you walk in love as Christ did, has loved us and given himself for us. So you see this sacrificial kind of walk that walk that word walk by the way <clears throat> is comes from the greek word peripateo it's an eris active imperative which simply means in simple koine english it's a present tense ongoing action paul was saying you all be imitators of god walk in love on an ongoing basis which tells us it's not a one shot deal you don't just do it once in a while. You have to constantly do this. You're constantly to aim for walking in the sphere of love. As Christ also loved us. He didn't, he didn't love us t once in a while. He constantly loved us. Not only in the cross, but he still loves us today. We're still, we're still basking in his love and his grace today. It doesn't cease. And so we're mandated to walk continually in the agapao love, the unconditional love, as Christ has also loved us, and here's the key, and given himself for us. So as we walk in this manner towards others, yes, we will be a sweet-smelling aroma to the people around us. They're going to say, I wish I have more of Jasmine around me. I wish I have more of uh, Gladys around me. She's so sweet. They're never mean to me. I wish we had more people like them because you know what? When I go over here, when I go to the bus stop, they all, they're so rude. They don't, they don't extend grace. They take the seat before me and there's no more consideration these days. I wish there were more people like Gladys, uh, Ruben, Nanita, Connie, Winston. I wish there's more people like them. Because at least they're, I don't know, they're just so kind. And it's not kindness necessarily. It's the love that comes from obedience to verses like this. As we're imitating God as children of God and walking in love as Christ did and loved us and gave himself for us, we're, we're capitalizing on these spiritual truths and doctrines and impacting the people around us which then becomes a sweet-smelling aroma. You know what a sweet-smelling aroma is? It just, it smells good. It's kind of like perfume or cologne. And it becomes pleasant to the nose. It just, you know, it's, it's pleasant. Or even if you think of food, sometimes food will elicit a response. Oh my gosh, now I'm hungry. Or sometimes just visually, I know this is no longer aroma, but how many times have you been watching TV and all of a sudden you see an ad for, something that's tasty and all it could be midnight and all of a sudden you're hungry and so it elicits a response and likewise when we're walking in love that's going to be a sweet, sweet smelling aroma to the people around us and that's why Paul says be imitators of God be like the father because you are dear children you're his children so imitate him as the father loves his children and as the children love the parents and the children in the human realm tends to um, follow their parents because they love their parents. Likewise, we should too. 
we should love our Father, our Heavenly Father. If our earth, if the human realm, if children try to imitate their parents, why? Because they love the parents. Likewise, should we not also imitate our Father? And that's the sense that we're seeing here in Ephesians 5.1. So we should be imitators of our Father. And we should walk in love as Christ has loved us. And so it's rich with all these truths. We can look at all these various doctrines if we wanted to. But now we're not going to be able to get into the book if we do that. But if you just look at verse 1, for example. I'll show you what Freddie would do. So you have a peek behind Freddy sh over Freddie's shoulder. I would look here and say again, I would focus on the word imitate. What does the word imitate mean? And the idea here... I think I wrote something down. Yeah, the first thing I wrote down was try to be like God. So Paul is telling us try to be like God as children. And that's where I came up with the whole idea. Well, I remember when Joshua was, was younger, he tried to be like daddy. Always hold my hand. He's always looking for me. When, when I had the Rocky, our German shepherd, 100 pound German shepherd, he would run and slam into the, the door and Joshua would just be a little terrified, but guess what? He would reach out, and I would hold his hand, and I would just pick him up, carry him, and he felt safe. Why? He's with his father. He knew that if he was with me, everything's going to be fine. Even though there's this 100-pound German shepherd right in front of him, hitting the glass door, it was rattling. As long as he was with me, he knew he was safe. Why? Because he was trusting in his father. And likewise, as dear children, we should try to be like God. We should follow God. We should imitate him. Why? Because he loves us. We're his children. And just as Joshua was protected by me, and sometimes he would try to be like me, he would, you know, drive like this. He put his hands up because he knew I was into cars a long time ago. So he would just say, Dad, Dad, look, I'm driving fast like you. And so he would copy me as a young boy. And uh, so I think that's what we're seeing here. Be imitators of our Father as children. So when you think about that, we, we tend not to think about those on the, on the human realm, human dimension, because sometimes we're so focused on the biblical context, which is perfectly fine and which is what we should but when you look at words like this, sometimes we have to think, okay, what, would, what does God the Holy Spirit want us to see? Is it just be, try to imitate God? Why does it say, as dear children? And so, if the scripture is replete with terms like children of God, Heavenly Father, Abba Father, so there's this dimension that we're a family. So if we're like a family and he's our heavenly father and we're his children, what can, we, what can we learn or what can we draw from in the human realm? Since he's using terms like father, children of God, uh, is there anything we could make a connection with? Just like he uses uh, vine and, and the branches and um, the metaphor in John 15, right? Sometimes... He uses illustrations and metaphors so that we can see with our mind's eye what he's trying to drive home. And Paul, under the influence of God the Holy Spirit, said, says, try to imitate God. Imit, be imitators of God as dear children. So the first thing that came to mind is try to be like God. And then the first thing that came up uh, was Joshua. So what does that tell me? Well, Joshua feels safe with me. He feels like I'm the king of the mountain or something. He just feels safe. So even there's a, even if there's a big dog that's scaring him, he knows to come after me, come to me, and nothing can touch him. Nothing will go wrong because Daddy's with him. And we likewise should have that mindset. Nothing will happen to us because Daddy's with us. We're with Christ. We're with the Father. In fact, we're in the in Christ's hand. Christ is in the Father's hand. So there's double security plus God the Holy Spirit 
triple security, nothing can happen to us. But we tend to look at things and stuff around us. And when that, when that preoccupi preoccupies our attention, we easily get distracted. And Satan is having a heyday saying, ah, see, they're losing out. They're afraid. They're afraid. And they're not even supposed to be afraid. See, God, uh, they're afraid. And the truth is, we should not have to be afraid. We walk by faith, not by sight. And so, I will repeat things over and over and over because that's how we learn. We don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. Faith, faith, faith. I don't have enough faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. So, as a man hears, he will... What is it? Oh, man, I blacked out there. Sheesh, I can't believe that. Sorry. Uh, Winston, you know that verse. Uh, the word, the Romans 10.17 passage. I blanked out there, folks. I guess I am maybe on the tired side. I'm not sure. But let me, let me, let me redeem my... You didn't say that, 10.17. Huh? Did I say that? You didn't say it. Yeah, yeah. So then faith... Oh yeah, faith comes by hearing. hearing okay, okay. Maybe it's just me. I'm uh, spacing out here, but uh, sorry. Anyway, so um, these two verses here. Anything else? I've been talking all this time, so I'm sorry. Um, I want to give you guys a chance if you want to say anything here. If not, we'll go right into our study. No thoughts? Nobody? Okay. We will just go right into the book now. We're on page 79. And so what I'm going to do is read the verse here. Uh, we're going to look at Ephesians 4, Hebrews 10, and we're going to go through the several points that he has here. And here's what we're going to do. So his first point is the first step of retreat is when the believer lives just like an unbeliever. So the idea here is spiritual retreat is, it's kind of a reversionism, it's kind of a backsliding direction. It's not a good thing. We're going to see in just a moment. The first step of retreat is when the believer lives just like an unbeliever. This is the walk of carnality, sarkinos in other words, and worldliness. This results in a vacuum. You know what a vacuum does? It draws and sucks in all the dirt, right? A vacuum is designed to pull things out of the floor, uh, the, the blinds, wherever you put the vacuum. And it's designed to, it causes a, a suction or a vacuum, a void in the mind. So, oh, this is the walk of carnality. or oh, the results in a vacuum, a void in the mind. We're looking at point number two. The mind of the believer is designed for the Word of God, Romans 12.2, Ephesians 4.23-24. He says the believer now attempts to fill the void with things of this world. We've talked about that recently. Note the picture in Jeremiah 2.13, 2, the Bible study ceases here. So there's a two-prong uh, problem. God, pe the pe people of Israel turn from God. And God is said to be a, if I recall, recall correctly, he's a living water. And then instead, Israel decides to have their own cistern. And we'll see that in just a moment. And so it's kind of like a, a bowl made, carved out by the hands of man or Israel. And they catch the rainwater instead of going to God for the water that he could have provided for them. So the believer now attempts to fill the void with the things of the world. And Jeremiah 2.13, I gave you a, a concise interpretation of that verse. Bible study ceases here. So there's no longer an interest in the Word of God. There's no longer an interest in God. And so it creates a vacuum. And people tend to try to fill that void up with things of the world, things that they get with their own hands. And they're never ever at peace or happy. And number three, the spiritual vacuum produces a blackout in the soul. On the number three on the bottom of 79, for those listening to the recording afterwards, 
The understanding darken, Ephesians 4.18, is the blackout of light from past Bible learning. So the things that you've acquired over time is now blacked out because there's this vacuum. And once we reject the necessity of Bible study in our life, we begin to dismantle, we break it apart, we um, disconnect the edification that's already in our soul. So there's things that are already in us, but we're disconnected because we're now, we have this vacuum in our soul that now eradicates and blurs out, blacks out what we previously have studied because now there's this problem with the soul. And we, it's linked to the sin nature, of course. So now when you look at I'm going to look at the Ephesians 4 passage in NLT. You'll notice what I'm putting here. Hebrews, oh, I'm sorry. We're going to look now at these two verses. We just read the 1, 2, and 3. We're going to look at Ephesians 4 because he cites that. Pastor Gene cites Ephesians 4, 7 to 9, 17 to 19, and Hebrews 10, 38 to 39. So now, here's he, Ephesians 4. <clears throat> With the Lord's authority, I'm using the NLT, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do. Gentiles are those who are no longer, or Gentiles are those who are not Jewish. So, for they are hopelessly confused. And those who are no longer, those who are the outside of the family of God, in other words. Live no longer as the Gentiles, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life of God. Uh, they're far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. So the contrast is from those who are walking like Gentiles and then in verse 20, that isn't what you learn, however, about Christ. So you don't, don't live like them. Because, and look at verse 17, they are hopelessly confused. Live no longer like unbelievers. Live, live, no, live no longer like the unbelievers for they are hopelessly confused. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. So now, Hebrews 10, which is the next verse that was on the opening of his book there, on page um, Hebrews 10, And my righteous one will live by faith, but I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. Notice that. My righteous ones will live by faith. We just talked about that a few moments ago. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. So I'm not going to be happy if someone turns away from me, God speaking. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be delivered whose souls will be saved. So you can look at this in a phase one, phase two aspect. We are faithful ones whose souls will be saved, but I think this is more of phase two because we can't be faithful ones if we're not first justified. So faithful ones who are believers in Christ, whose souls will be delivered, phase two. Delivered from problems. So my righteous ones those who are believers will be will live by faith every one of you who have has placed their faith in Christ are considered righteous ones so he says my righteous ones will live by faith but i will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away so if you're going to live by faith good but if i will not take pleasure in anyone who turns away which means there are going to be some who could turn away like Israel and others, even with the family of God, some can turn away. We've seen this in the past. We've seen this with the prodigal son and other examples in Corinthians where Paul says, 
turn them over, turn them over to Satan, that his soul will be saved and preserved. Verse 39, but we are not like those who turn away from God. There are some who will turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones. Again, faithful ones can only refer to those who have been justified. There are no such things as justified unbelievers. There are no such things as faithful unbelievers. There's only faithful believers or unfaithful believers. Both saved, but in verse 38, I take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. So it is possible to turn away, as we saw in John chapter 6, remember? Where Jesus was teaching, unless you take this, my eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, you have no part with me. And the, the Jews who believe said, I can't follow this, it's a hard saying. And many of them walked with him no more. Some believed, some didn't. But many of them walked with him no more. And then what did he do? He turned to his twelve. He said, do you guys want to leave too? Suggesting that it is possible to turn away. Remember that? John 6, 66. John 6, 66. And many disciples walked with him no more. <clears throat> they turned away. And then he, talked, he looked at his disciples and said, do you all want to leave too? <clears throat> and they said, no. Where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. And so they didn't. But the fact that he raised the question to his elite suggests that it is possible for any of us to turn away. But God will say, I take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. Unbelievers don't turn away, only believers. So that's what we're seeing here in Hebrews 10. Now, going on with the book. Now we're on page 8 going with the rest of his points. Now we're in uh, number four. We enter a life alienated from God and His grace. The abundant life is rejected for temporal life. We have volitionally isolated ourselves spiritually and alienated ourselves from God's will. So you see that in Galatians 5, 1 to 7. And number five, the heart now becomes hardened and the soul is scarred. The process is called hardness of heart. You see this in Ephesians 4.18, Hebrews 3.7, as well as in verse 15. So it's a destructive process in the soul resulting from rejection, rejecting God or His Word. So we can reject God, we can reject His Word, and the result will be the same. First, it is volitional. Then God, God hardens the heart as judgment. So God will make it dif more difficult because you've shown that you have no interest in Him or His Word. Then He hardens your heart by bringing more focus on what, what it is you don't like, such as His Word, such as Himself. So then it starts off volitionally. And the easiest way to demonstrate this is remember, and some people sometimes say it's not fair and it, it's not good that God would do this but you remember <clears throat> um, Pharaoh Pharaoh hardened his heart to God and then the scripture says God hardened Pharaoh's heart remember that? well it's not that God reached in and squeezed Pharaoh's heart I use this example and this seems to help people understand it better and sometimes I Think it, I make it more confusing. Sometimes I don't. But here, here's my example that I shared when I was in California. When it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, you'll notice that prior to that, multiple, several times it says Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, several times before you see God hardening Pharaoh's heart. So I, I liken it to, let's just say, I have, I have two girls as they're growing up. Um, I do have two girls and they grew under our roof and there were times where they would get upset at me because I would say specific things. I want this done and they would say, why? And so let's just say, for example, um, I said, clean up your room before you go out and they said, no. And so let's just say hypothetically, they said, well, I'm not going to clean up my room. I'm of age now. I can do whatever I want. 
I said, well, you go do whatever you want. I'm going to lock that door. You can't come back in or something like that. And so they get mad or even not even locking the door. They just say, I'm, I'm out of here, Dad. So they leave and they, let's just say they run away. Well, when they go to their friends and they say, what happened? Well, my dad kicked me out of the house. I've never kicked them out of the house. I said, I want you to clean your room. And so therefore, in their eyes, I hardened their heart. And so I never did anything to make them leave. I just set down the boundaries as the authority. I want this done before you go out for a movie. And I insisted that they cooperate with house rules. As they live under my, my house, I expect certain things done in a way that would be consistent as a parental love towards them, teaching them responsibilities. And so they run away, well, one or both of them run away because they didn't like it. And so they say, well, my dad made me leave. So, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to clean my room. So as they're explaining that to their friends, there's a sense that I made them run away, right? But not, at, not really. I set down the boundaries and I set down the authority of the house. I said, clean your room. I never forced them out of the house. They just, they hardened their heart against my rules. So I didn't make them leave. They, their hearts were hardened because they didn't listen to the mandate of the home, the mandate of their father. So that would be the same thing with Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his heart. No, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to let your people go. I'm not going to let your people go. I'm not going to let your people go. And finally, God did the same thing because he raised it. Unless you let my people go, so Pharaoh's heart was hardened. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Why? Because he made the mandate again. Un you let my people go. So he said the same thing. If you notice, let my people go, let my people go. No, no, no. He hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then when it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it was only hardened because God said the same thing. Let my people go. I'm not going to change. I said let my people go. So in that sense, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, not because he reached in somehow and made him say, you can't choose otherwise. No, God remained consistent. He was stable he said, let my people go. He sent plague after plague after plague. And what happened to Pharaoh? No, 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 no. And then he let him go at the end. And then he hardened his heart again. He went after um, God's people. He went after Israel. So harden, 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 harden. Then God, it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Not because he did something to Pharaoh, but because God raised the decree again. Let my people go. Just like I said, clean your room. So then they left home because my dad made me. I didn't make them. They hardened their hearts. And when I said, clean your room, in that sense, it makes it look like it was my fault. But it wasn't my fault. I was standing firm on house rules. So the heart now becomes hardened. Point number five. The soul scarred the process called hardness of heart. Ephesians 4.18, Hebrews 3.7 and 15 is the destructive process in the soul resulting in, from rejecting God or His Word. So likewise, if we reject God, if we reject His Word, we're hardening our hearts. First it is the volitional, then God hardened the heart as judgment. So I think uh, Gene might have a slightly different take here because he says God hardens the heart as judgment. So I have uh, no problem with this view as well. Exodus 4.21, 7.3, Romans 1, 18-28. And so <clears throat> you can see, well even in the Romans 1, 18-28, I see that more of a he's turning them over to themselves. We've seen that three times. Uh, as people suppress the truth, what does God do? Three times he turns them over to themselves, turns them over to themselves. So now, because they rejected God, God said, okay, this is how it's going to be without my help. I'm going to turn you over to yourself. You don't want me? Here, have at it. You are by yourself. So it's almost like he removes some kind of restrictive... Um, it seems like before he turns them over, there's a sense where 
he's preventing the sin nature from taking full control of themselves. Because what you get, go through Romans 1, 18, all the way down to 32, it intensifies men with men, women with women, doing shameful things. So you see that God was involved with these individuals. And I, I take in context, it's not only unbelievers, but believers as well. Because Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for deliverance. So Paul will only say that to the believers. I'm not ashamed for the gospel. And I think the recipients in Romans 1 is primarily believers, but it also applies to unbelievers. So, number six, the rebel now betrays himself to self-gratification, worldliness. This is the frantic search for happiness. Now there's this void, there's this scar tissue, this frantic search for happiness. What am I going to do? How am I going to pacify myself? How am I going to make myself feel good? Seen in James 4, 1 to 4, where do wars and fights come from? Do they not come from yourselves, basically, is what Romans James 4 is talking about. And Ezekiel 16. The word for deliver over, Ephesians 4.19, is the same word used for Judas's betrayal of the Lord. So the believer's sin now becomes idolatry and spiritual adultery. The friend of the world has made himself an enemy of God. James 4.4, Philippians 3.18. And the final stage in total defilement is implacable lust. Every kind of impurity means all limits and boundaries have been, top of 81, passed. Romans 1, 18, uh, Romans 1, 28 to 32. And greediness is a word meaning insatiable, insati insatiable and implacable, unable to be satisfied. And the soul has become a broken cistern. And remember, I uh, kind of gave you a concise uh, focus on James, Jeremiah 2.13. And so the idea there is there's two. In fact, if you want to turn there really quickly, um, let's go to Jeremiah 2.13. You'll notice that there are two things here. And I, Jeremiah 2. 13, and this is where we will conclude, by the way. Jeremiah 2, 13. I'm going to read from the NLT to keep it simple. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. So there you have the idea that, you know, God is this living water. He was providing their sustenance to keep them going, to keep them alive. But instead, they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns. And this cracked cisterns is like a, a jar or a clay of some sort. They would chisel away and create a, um, like a pot to collect water for themselves from the rain. So instead of going to God, they were trying to fix it themselves. They were trying to take care of themselves without God's help. And that these cracked cisterns can hold no water at all. And the only water that can be available to them is rain since they're no longer going to God. So there's the sense that the rain comes from God, but God is not showing it that way because he's saying, you could have been coming to me, the fountain of living water, but instead... You've dug for yourselves, themselves, cracked cisterns. Cistern is a container that would con catch water. It would be hold. It would hold some kind of liquids, uh, oils, and in this context, it would be water. So the contrast: there's two evil things. They've abandoned me, the fountain of living water, using the NLT, and they've dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can that can hold no water at all. So you would rather try to fix it yourself rather than go to me, the fountain of living water. And God's like, all right, go ahead. So that was the two evil things, no longer going to God and trying to do things on your own. And that's the same thing that we're seeing here. And that's the whole idea of 
this spiritual retreat. It's, it's retreating from God. It's no longer going to God, trusting God, living for God, and letting Him fulfill your needs because He knows them better than we do. We think we know what it is, but when we have that, that void, the blackening out of the soul because we're no longer going to the living source, the living water, then we're going to produce this blackout in our soul which then create a vacuum inside and now we're no longer content. We're no longer um, calm and stable because we're constantly in a search for happiness. We're trying to fill that void that can only be accomplished through pursuing God and His Word. We have to pursue God and His Word. Otherwise, we're going to realize that we can't do it. That's what we're seeing here in... Notice what, uh, let's see. In, uh, we'll close here in verse 48. We have vol volitionally, and looking at number five, we have volitionally isolated ourselves spiritually and alienated ourselves from God's will. Instead of being set apart from the world, we are separated, separated from God. And so, this is a very good section, some key doctrines here that we could spend quite some time on. So I would encourage you to delve in this even more and read when you have time the book, especially this section here, because it's rich with key doctrines here that will help you see the importance of sticking close to God, uh, staying with His Word, being consistent so that when you go through hardship, you'll realize, we did we depart from the living water, the source? Have we shunned doctrine? Have we shunned our relationship with God? And if so, there's going to be a blackout inside. We're going to wonder what's going on when it could be rectified by simply confessing our sins, first and foremost, then going to Him for the source. Because that's His desire. His desire is not to ruin us or break us, he wants to sustain us. Just as children should be going to their parents, children should look up to the parents, we as children of God should be looking up to our Heavenly Father. We should be dependent upon our Father so that when some danger comes, when a, a spiritual big doggy comes after us, we can go to Him because He's going to protect us. He's going to keep us safe. There is nothing that could come between us and God so long as we're focused on Him. Now, we will never lose our salvation, but sometimes we may feel like that. We may never be um, completely unsafe, even though we may feel that at times. But if we do, there's, it's possible that it's really us because we're not spiritually recharged, we're not going to the source of the living water, when in fact we're just doing things on our own. So hopefully that's not the case. So this is where we will stop. We're out of time now. And so I'll close in prayer and thank you for your time. And this is what I thrive on, just looking at his word. Hopefully you enjoyed it as well. So let's close in prayer and then I'll see you all either tomorrow or Thursday. So... Father, thank you as always for giving us the opportunity to uh, stand together for an hour and ten minutes or so to look at your word and to be reminded of how important it is to be uh, forward retreat, uh, go, fo going forward rather than retreating. We know, Father, that if we advance, that we would not feel like we're in a, a search for happiness because true happiness comes from a vibrant relationship with you not as a result of finding things that are material, and not that material things are bad, but uh, sometimes the things that are void in our soul is a result of a rapport with thee. And it has nothing to do with material things. In fact, the scripture is clear. What shall a man profit if he gains everything in this world, but forfeits his soul? And so likewise, what profit is it if we have everything that the world has to offer and still have that void? We're going to discover, should we win the lotto? Should we win uh, the big uh, Powerball or whatever it is? I don't think we would be completely happy because it's not contingent upon money or anything material. It's contingent upon uh, a relationship with you. 
I'm not saying those things can't help us in things with the things of the world uh, as far as helping us with insurance, a new car, reliable transportation. But ultimately, Father, it's really about uh, entrusting everything with you and seeing how you operate through uh, the lens of faith. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity for us to assemble together. I pray, as always, to keep everyone safe, keep them healthy so that they can see firsthand that you are a God who provides answers, you provide solutions, even though we may not be like the world. And so we win because we have the advantage. We are um, going to be one day with thee. And I'm grateful for the fact that we all have placed our faith in you. And perchance, if anybody's here that has never placed their faith, and I doubt that unless they're listening to the recording on YouTube, I pray that they would acquiesce to Jesus Christ by simply believing in Christ. The scripture is clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you for loving us, Father. We love you as well. Help us to be more Christ-like. Help us to be imitators of God as we learn more about you more and more throughout our studies, throughout our intake of your word as we inculcate it. We ask and pray all of these things through Christ's matchless name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Bye, Ron. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Freddie. Okay, Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. God bless everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Pastor Freddie. Okay, Karen. Thank you.